Hello, everyone, I'm Zhao Chuang. Welcome to PNSO Marine Museum Scientific Art Exhibition of Ron the Mesosaurus and the family Mesosauridae. More than 200 million years ago, before the Mesozoic era, reptiles began to march from land to sea. For example, the earliest Mesosaurus moved near the sea or in shallow water areas, returning to the ocean once in a while. This happened occasionally, but things were completely different in the Mesozoic era. A large number of reptiles of various species returned to the ocean. Throughout the Mesozoic era, they became the top predators of among all marine organisms. They occupied almost every corner of the ocean. Since the Triassic, many marine reptiles appeared one after another. They occupied every corner of the ocean. The groups Plesiosauria, Plesiosauria, and ichthyosauria that we are familiar with were among the best. These animals had dominated the entire Jurassic Ocean since they entered the water in the Triassic. Even until the first half of the Cretaceous period, these animals still dominated the ocean. Among them, there was the famous suborder Pliosauroidea. Pliosaurs were once the overlord of the whole ocean. They had huge mouths and sharp teeth and they once stood on the top of the food chain of the entire ocean. No one could break this record for a long time until the emergence of Mesosaurs. The emergence of the superfamily Mesosauroidea was an inspirational story. They were tiny reptiles at first, and they did not come to the ocean after the extinction of large animals. They swam against the current from the bottom of the food chain, Wandering near the beach, they grew all the way to large predators. During this period, large marine animals, such as Crinosaurus, still lived in the sea. The giants did not stop mesosaurs. However, their transformation into giant carnivores was somewhat related to the gradual extinction of large plesiosaurs, like pliosaurs. Today, our theme is Ron the Mesosaurus. Let's follow it to understand the whole evolution of mesosaurs. The animal we see first was called Agilosaurus. It was a close relative of a Varanus with a length of only one meter that lived in present-day Croatia, Europe in the Cretaceous period. This animal looked very similar to many Varanus today. It had a slender body like some modern slender lizards who like swimming. Although few fossils have been found, we can still see that it could swim somewhat from its limbs. It is even possible that its fingertips might have a membrane. Its skull became slender, this long shape could help it quickly catch things in the sea, such as small fish. It could even probe into the rock crevices to catch mollusks and the like. Although this animal was tiny, its body structure showed a trend of marching into the ocean with some adaptability. This makes people begin to respect the close relatives of Mesosaurus in the later period. This was a Dalazaurus. It was not big, only one meter long. Compared with the previous Agilosaurus, it was more adapted to marine life. Its body looked more streamlined. Its fossils were complete. Its head looked more pointed. The whole body was more like a spindle, but it's not exactly a full sea lizard. It still had claws on its limbs, indicating that it had the ability to live on land. Because claws were useless in the ocean, it should be able to go ashore and live there, like the modern terrapin, which seemed to have webbed feet, but still had claws. Amazingly, the previous mentioned Agilosaurus was not especially good at swimming, and neither was this Dalazaurus. But these two animals were half a world away, one was found in America and the other in Europe. Even though the northern hemisphere was a whole continent, the distance between them was great. 
Therefore, we can speculate that this group of animals' mobility or abundance was much higher than we thought. At that time, the group had occupied shallow seas all over the world. When the large marine animals lived in the deep sea, the shallow sea was a short-lived opportunity for them. This may also be the reason why this animal could live amphibiously. Next is Carsosaurus, found in Slovenia in Europe, an early Mesosa. The limbs of this animal looked amphibious. It was a little bigger than Agilosaurus or Dalasaurus, at 2 meters long. Several embryos in the belly remained curly. Early studies showed that the embryo of this kind of animal suggested that it might be viviparous. There is no direct evidence to contradict this claim. It seems that it was still a well-developed embryo without traces of eggshells. So many scientists think that they could deliver in the water, like plesiosaurs or ichthyosaurs. From one perspective, this explains that these animals might adapt to living in the water. We have long believed that eggs cannot hatch in the water. Therefore, if an animal wants to breed in the water, it must deliver a cub directly. The embryo of Carsosaurus may have proved this view. Of course, there are some challenges to this statement. In the last two years, a very large egg was found, a soft shell egg. This egg was characterized as being produced by a large lizard. To give birth to such a large egg, the lizard must be more than 8 or 9 meters long, an animal of the size of a giant mesosa. So now we generally think that this egg might be a mesosaur's egg. Therefore, the specimen of Carsosaurus may not indicate that it was a species that directly delivered cubs in the water. It is possible that the shape of the embryo in its body was before the soft shell was produced, or the soft shell was not preserved at all. Or the soft shell was not preserved at all. Next, we have the Clydasts. Clydasts had developed a body structure suitable for swimming. Its spine was connected firmly. That's why it got its name, locked vertebrae. This shows that it could resist the ocean's pressure. Its sturdy body shows that it was mainly powered by its tail, unlike early animals, which were clumsy when they just got into the water, and they needed to flex their whole body to struggle with swimming, resulting in a large loss of body energy. Clydastus' body hardly moved, just like the fish and today's cetaceans, that live in the sea at all time and are propelled by its tail. This feature shows that at least in the era of Clydastus, mesosaurs were already highly adapted to the ocean. At the same time, the plesiosaurs withered so much that only large ones, such as the late Elasmosaurus, and highly specialized ones, such as Polycotylus, remained. Pliosaurs were almost extinct. Ichthyosaurs were also highly specialized. Mesosaurs filled the vacancy that the disappeared pliosaurs left, and replaced pliosaurs. The reason why it replaced pliosaurs is that in the Jurassic period plesiosaurs were divided into two categories, pliosaurs and plesiosauroids. Plesiosauroids mainly preyed on small fish, because they had a tiny head. Pliosaurs had a huge head and was a top predator. After pliosaurs became extinct, for some time, there were no such large predatory animals in the ocean. If mesosaurs were not powerful predators, in any case plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs, the fish-eating animals were not competing against them. Such a vacancy was just right for mesosaurs to fill. Mesosaurs evolved and replaced the niche of pliosaurs. Next is Echnosaurus. Although it was not a large Mesosa predator, it also had something special. It had a long head, which looked different from that of the previous Mesosaurs. It shows that Mesosaurs were not all having a single body shape, but different species had features that had gradually evolved to adapt and perform various functions. In addition, Echnosaurus had something special from the perspective of research. 
Its skin was well preserved, which lets us know the epidermal characteristics of these animals. Before complete fossils like Echnosaurus were found, in early paintings of Mesosaurus, it was painted like a crocodile clad in armor. But the Echnosaurus fossils let us know that Mesosaurus had fine scales on its body. The scales were rhombic and were tightly locked together. The rhombuses were arranged in countless parallel horizontal rows of spines along the body. When it swam, it felt no resistance in the direction of the current. It might have evolved such scales to adapt to swimming. Although many lizards on land also have such scales locally, they did not have so many fine scales that mesosaurs did. In addition, the scales on its head were larger than those on its body, and the shape was also similar. There was no decoration on its back, so its whole body was round and streamlined, highly adapted to running water. In the early years, some reconstructions of Mesosaurus draw the back like an iguana. It is because similar impressions were found in the early years. These had mane-like structures on the back. It was later learned that those structures were caused by decomposed muscles, and not scales on the epidermis. If you can imagine that animals like Mesosaurs had structures on their back like the marine iguanas, which would hinder its swimming. The next is plate carpus. Plate carpus was small, usually about 4-6 meters long. The limbs of plate carpus had undergone strange changes. Its forelimbs evolved to become big, and its posterior limbs were small. Its talus was like a plate, which indicates that its limbs had become fins highly suitable for swimming. Some early mesosaurs had limbs with complete arm or leg bones. Although they became fins, there were still flexible joints inside. Looking at the arm of the early mesosaurs, we can see between the humerus and radius there was a joint which was a feature of terrestrial animals. But for the entire arm of plate carpus, fused, is not the correct word. It was locked together like jigsaw puzzle pieces, forming a board-like structure. Its arm and leg were similar. Its limbs were flat, large, and hard, suitable for swimming. The next is the very famous Tylosaurus. Tylosaurus lived in present-day North America and Europe and was an advanced mesosa. Its body was well adapted to the ocean because its full limbs were bigger and its posterior limbs were smaller. This was the feature of many organisms that are highly adapted to water. They all had gone through such a process. Typical examples are cetaceans or the chondrothians that were somewhat related to the early sharks. The cetacean also had all limbs as fins when they first entered the water, but today's cetaceans only have for limbs as fins, their posterior limbs have degenerated. Early chondrothians, such as Helicoprion, also degenerated their rear fins to adapt to high-speed swimming, leaving only their front fins. Another example is ichthyosaurs. Although ichthyosaurs evolved very slowly, the later thunosaurs, like Ophthalmosaurus, also had large forelimbs and reduced posterior limbs. There are many such examples, including today's sea turtles. Tylosaurus, a mesosa, also had such characteristics. Let's look at Tylosaurus tail. Starting from at least Tylosaurus, mesosaurs started to evolve to have a crescent-shaped tail. The name Tylosaurus means knob lizard, which means that it had a knob-like structure on its nose. Its teeth were not like those of other animals, which began to grow close to the front of the mouth. If the front of its mouth was here, its teeth grew from here, a segment in the front of its mouth had no teeth, and had evolved into a solid spherical shape. Therefore, many scientists believed that, when it was alive, the surface might have a hard material, which could ram into other animals and do damage. This was also a powerful skill of Tylosaurus. In addition, the jaw of Tylosaurus also retained some primitive characteristics of lizards and snakes. It means that Tylosaurus inherited a habit of lizards and snakes, but its structure was not quite the same as theirs. A Chinese saying is that a man whose heart is not content is like a snake that tries to swallow an elephant. From the perspective of human nature, the line teaches us not to be too greedy. But from the perspective of biology, 
it describes that a snake can swallow something several times larger than its head, it's because the snake has a unique quadrate bone, which can make its mouth open wide. Mosasaurs, especially Tylosaurus, had a quadrate bone not as flexible as that of the snake, instead, they had a huge slide, where the mandible was connected to the quadrate bone. This enabled its mandible to pull back slightly. When swallowing, this structure could move the food backward with the help of the mandible to swallow the food into the stomach. This slide also enabled its mandible to open wide, allowing it to hunt very large animals. Although some species of the earlier mosasaurs were huge, they still mainly ate fish or mollusks. In the time of Tylosaurus, they were already able to prey on large animals. Next, we will have a look at Prognathodon. Prognathodon also had a small body. In general, the length of the Prognathodon fossil was only about 5 meters, but some large specimens, which might be Prognathodon, could reach 14 meters. The reason why Prognathodon was so fascinating is because there were many important findings about Prognathodon, useful for reconstructing Mosasaurus. A very intact Prognathodon specimen showed the shape of the flippers. When we reconstructed Mosasaurus before, we often reconstructed its finger outlines into a paddle. But now, from the complete fossil imprints of the forelimbs of Prognathodon, we know that the forelimb of Prognathodon looked much like that of a shark. Although the bones inside were like a square, the soft tissues outside show that they wrapped a triangular fin-like structure, like a shark fin. And behind this fin was a caudal fin, like a shark's. Such a structure indicated that it was not only adapted to the ocean, but also was a fast swimmer. The tail of Prognathodon still retained skin impressions. The earlier reconstructions of Mosasaurus had tail drawn as that an eel. Eel tail is usually a feature of slow swimming animals, the area that propels is small, so eel does not swim well. But the cold fin impression of Prognathodon shows that this animal already had a two-lobed tail resembling that of a shark. If you compare it with a shark or an ichthyosaur, it is still the more primitive type, with a bent tail, one side is small and the other is big. It's not a crescent tail. Nevertheless, it shows that Mosasaur's tail was highly adapted to marine life. It had evolved and looked like a shark's. Next, let's look at Anosaurus, also a close relative of Tylosaurus, and similar to Tylosaurus. So some scholars even believed that it was a Tylosaurus species, but its body also showed some differences from Tylosaurus. For example, its tail looked shorter, Scientists once found in its stomach turtles, large fish, even remains of plesiosaurs. This proved again that animals like this like to eat large creatures. It was a strong predator, the top predator in the ocean. But in a way, the current evidence of Anosaurus seems to show that its tail was short, which may indicate that its swimming ability was not strong, at least not fast, and the animals it preyed on, such as turtles or plesiosaurs, swam slowly. This fact may indicate that mosasaurs have differentiated in various ways to adapt to different types of foods. Large animals like Anosaurus were probably specialized in catching large and slow prey. Speaking of adapting to the environment and the niche, the plate carpus, which we will see next, was very small. It was only between 4.5 and 7.5 meters long, a small species. But this species had evolved to have a surprising feature, the superfamily Mesosauroidea. First of all, compared with other mosasaurs, its eyes were huge, which shows that it could adapt to many environments, both day and night. It might be highly adaptive regardless of visibility. Many animals sleep at night, but this one might sleep intermittently during the day and night. Another point may also indicate that it adapted to various degrees of depth. In low light environments deep in the ocean, its big eyes could be useful. This also shows that it might be able to dive into the deep sea. Today, through the analysis of body structure, 
we can learn that mesosaurs like different regions of various depths. For example, as mentioned earlier, Tylosaurus was more suitable for deep water, Mesosaurus, to be mentioned later, may be suitable for shallow water. Animals such as Pliaplate Carpus had big eyes, so they obviously could adapt to the deep environment. In addition to its big eyes, another feature was that its brain capacity was much larger than that of other Mesosaurs. This means that it was a very smart animal. Its brain processed its surroundings, and its own behaviors much better than peers. It could make quick decisions to respond to changes around it. Other records showed that some fossils of Pliaplate Carpus were found in the estuaries. A finding seems to suggest that this animal might adapt to freshwater. In other words, it was adapted to both salt water and freshwater. This was also a powerful ability of Pliaplate Carpus. Speaking of adaptability, I have to mention Glibidans. Compared with other mesosaurs, a special feature of Glibidans was that its teeth evolved into a spherical shape. We know that most mesosaurs were top predators with sharp teeth, but the teeth of Glibidans were blunt. It could not prey on other large animals. The spherical teeth were suitable for eating hard shell animals. It could eat crabs and mussels. This again shows that this animal liked to move at the bottom of the sea. Although it possibly lived in shallow seas, it still showed the niche it occupied was different from the niche occupied by other mesosaurs. This proves again mesosaurs were highly differentiated. Next is Mesosaurus, the genus represented by Ron the Mesosaurus. Mesosaurus may not be the earliest found species, but it was the earliest formally described. This picture shows a feature of Mesosaurus' head. It can be seen that Mesosaurus had highly marine-like teeth in its mouth. Every tooth was huge and stout. The section of each tooth was round and strong. And you can see that it had a lot of fine lines on its teeth, vertical lines. This is also a characteristic of marine predators. It is possible that this feature will be of great help to pierce slippery animals, like fish or mollusks. A highly aquatic dinosaur, Spinosaurus, also had teeth with such a feature. The head of Mesosaurus was also huge, and its mandible was also very thick and had a strong bite. Mesosaurus also inherited the characteristics of the Varanus and snake, it probably also had a forked tongue. Although there was no direct evidence of this in fossils, some scholars believe that something that could project the tongue out can be found in the mouth. You may feel that it is unlikely that it sensed the taste around the tongue in the marine salty water environment. But today's sea snake, having adapted to the ocean, still has this function. Moreover, the tongue of sea snakes also depends on the sensitivity to determine the positions of surrounding animals, using this knowledge as an aid to understand the environment. For such animals, it was also a necessary feature, like the case on the land. We can also see that the head of Mesosaurus had evolved into a spindle shape. In the past, we thought that there was no ear or ear hole in the place where they should have been. Some people even thought that Mesosaurus was deaf. But later, we found a mummified eardrum on the head of a well-preserved Tylosaurus. So we know that there was an exposed eardrum on its head. This eardrum might be highly resistant to water pressure. It was solid. The last thing I have to say is the extinction of Mesosaurs. Next is Goronosaurus from Africa, which lived late. It was one of the latest Mesosaurs we know of. Goronosaurus lived in Africa and was not as big as Tylosaurus or Mesosaurus. But it was also a huge creature, and its body structure was specialized to some extent. First of all, its eyes were tiny, unlike many mesosaurs. Many mesosaurs had huge eyes and keen vision. Their adaptation to the ocean mainly depends on vision, for example, the Pliaplacarpus we talked about earlier. 
but Goronyosaurus was the opposite. It evolved to look a bit like today's cetaceans, with poor eyesight. Instead, it was sensitive to touch, much more so than other mosasaurs. By scanning its skull, we now find that it had highly developed trigeminal nerves covering the entire face. Especially in the ocean, in an environment full of water, it might be sensitive to the vibrations of the surrounding water. This might make up for its lack of vision. Its limbs were incomplete. We don't know how well it could swim for now. But through understanding this species, we see that mosasaurs were still a very prosperous group even when it was close to extinction. At least it showed the possibility of evolution in other directions. Therefore, the extinction of mosasaurs was not due to the conditions of the species itself, but like other extinct species 66 million years ago, they all went through an unfortunate change, and these thriving species were dying out. Now, let's meet a model of from the Mesosaurus. It is a reconstruction of Mesosaurus, a model scaled down using the same proportions based on many new studies. You can see it shows the unique appearance of the Mesosaurus genus. Its body was still thick, but also long. Its head-to-body ratio gives the impression that its head was tiny. This is also one unique feature of Mesosaurus. By first looking at its lateral side, we can see its whole body is highly streamlined. It doesn't have an obvious thorax and a change in shape between its back and head. It's a simple and streamlined form. We now know that a large amount of fat is stored inside to make its body more suitable for swimming. Then at its chest, Mesosaurus fulims were very developed, its chest had become very broad. The wide chest cavity also allowed it to swallow bigger chunks of food. Although it had such a feature, the flesh beneath was still developed, so that it could keep a streamlined shape as this model shows. The forelimbs of Mesosaurus were bigger than its hindlimbs, and the shape of the forelimbs is taken from the fossil of Prognathodon. We know its shape was more like that of a shark. If you look inside at its bones, you can vaguely see from the model the trace of its fingers. It was not like some ichthyosaurs, with the whole finger like jigsaw pieces, or corns, being flatly pieced together into a plane, leaving no traces. Mesosaurus was not like this because the traces of fingers were still visible, but its fingers, unlike animals on land, had no nails. Its knuckles were numerous, making its fingers very long, and like fish fins. Its fifth finger was very short, possibly extending back to support the back of this fin, which had a structure similar to the cord of fin. Also, you can see, the head of Mesosaurus, when it closes its mouth, looks like that of a lizard. It had lips to ensure that its teeth stayed within its mouth, and then its eyes were located at about one-third from the back of the head, or two-thirds viewed from the front. The eyes were here. It had an ear canal here, an eardrum above the ear canal. Its nose was already facing up to make it convenient to stick its head slightly out of water to breathe. In addition, its mandible was triangular. Why this at this position? Some scholars believe that its mandible could move slightly, like a human arm. But of course, not as great as the arm. Its joints, unlike dinosaurs' interlocked joints, had a distinct junk. When it was alive, there might be a large amount of cartilages filling inside. Some experts believe that the cartilages might give it elasticity, or allow it to move about like this or open like this, so it could swallow more or large. In addition, the rear of its mandible became wider to accommodate larger muscles, so that it could have a stronger bite. Seen from above, we can find another difference between Mesosaurus and Tylosaurus. The entire skull of Tylosaurus was very narrow, but the rear of Mesosaurus had become visibly wide. Compared with Tylosaurus, it was possibly more vicious and stronger in appearance. Then, upon closer examination, you may notice that it is covered with rhombus-shaped scales. These scales were first discovered in Ectosaurus, Later, on some fossils of Prognathodon, even some fossils of Mesosaurus and Tylosaurus, fine and dense scales were also found. There were also transverse crests. 
If these crests were vertical, they might generate resistance. However, they caused no resistance when they were transverse. When it swam, they made the body more streamlined. We have mentioned the shape of its fins as well as the shape of its tail. They were also based on our research on tails from the fossils of Prognathodon and even some Tylosaurus in recent years. We know that a lot of Mosasa tails might have a bent and be like a crescent with two tail lobes, unlike that of the earlier reconstructions, an eel tail that is not well suitable for swimming. This again shows that although Mosasaurus was huge, it still had powerful mobility. On the tail of Mosasaurus, if there was no skin impression of the cord fin, you can still find traces from its bones, which showed its neural spines. You can see from what is called the tail bend, starting from the axis of this part. Generally, the neural spines of mesosaurs on the anterior bones pointed backward, while those on the rear part pointed forward, possibly forming a tail bend at an intersection here, forming an angle. On this model, we feel bold enough to put a dorsal fin, despite there is no evidence on any mesosaurus fossil specimen currently known. We designed this way because we have talked about the topic with some fish experts. They thought that this was typical of the action of mesosaurs when swimming, especially for mesosaurs in the later period. We know that starting with clydasts, the body of mesosaurs had become stiff. The propulsion mainly came from the left and right swings of the tail. All its movement was much like that of fish. If its tail swung from left to right, its body might shake slightly, causing the body to tilt. At this point, if it relied on its limbs to keep balance, then it would consume a considerable amount of energy. If there were a dorsal fin on its back at a right position, it might be useful in balancing its body. So we were bold enough to add a dorsal fin when designing this Mesosaurus model. Another point is details about its mouth. In its mouth, although we didn't make a projecting tongue, you can see its forked tongue, like this. The close relatives of Mesosaurus, both Varanus and snakes, can project their tongues. Also, today's sea snakes live in the sea, but they still have and use tongues. Based on these features, we can speculate that Mesosaurus possibly retained the projecting tongue. Some scholars believe that on the mandible of the Mesosaurus, there were muscles responsible for projecting the tongue. So when we reconstructed, we accepted this view, although we did not make the tongue obvious. Also, on its upper jaw, you can see their unique pterygoid teeth, arranged like to hands embracing something. The two rows of pterygoid teeth worked when mesosaurs swallowed. They pushed the food into the throat as the jaw twitched backward. The last thing we want to talk about is Mesosaurus body color. Just now, when we talked about Tylosaurus, we briefly mentioned that many Tylosaurus species liked to live in deep water. Mesosaurus, on the other hand, preferred the shallow seas. Studies on Mesosaurus body pigments also somewhat verified this point. Some of the better Mesosaurus specimens had pigment fossils found on their bodies. These pigments show that on its back, the color was very dark, while its belly was of a lighter color. So its body was like a great white shark in having a countershading effect. This means that the lighting coming from above would light up this part, and the shadow below would darken the belly. Both these effects would make its body gray and less three-dimensional, so it could blend in with its surroundings. This effect is called animals countershading. Many animals similarly have a white belly and a black back. Mesosaurus possibly looked like a great white shark. So when we reconstructed, its coloring was almost like a great white shark or a killer whale, a fast swimming predator. This is also verified that the Mesosaurus might have adapted to shallow seas, because the countershading feature only worked in shallow seas, where sunlight is sufficient. So this also supports that Mesosaurus chose shallow seas as its habitat. For Tylosaurus, both the upper and lower parts might be light blue or light gray blue, possibly like this, with no clear boundaries between the upper and lower parts. Well, that's all about the model of Ron the Mesosaurus. Thank you all.